Chapter 5, Section 1 Why the Record Companies Are Rich and You're Not, Part 2 By now, having been through Chapter 4, you may be thinking that there are a lot of powerful people in the music industry who are out to get you. And if you are a student of history, you know that workers over the centuries have been abused in many instances. So, the difficulties that you face belong in a larger context, and the larger context is a correct understanding of the nature of business in much of the capitalist world. The Freedom Guide is not going to revisit any of the usual economic arguments. We care neither for Adam Smith, being the father of capitalism, and Karl Marx, who is credited with being the father of communism. Suffice it to say that slavery was about a hundred years old when Karl Marx, before even Adam Smith began to write, and even before that, there was something we discussed in the Middle Ages. From chapter 3 we discussed about nobles and kings owning all the real estate. The people that they had on the land in Europe were called serfs, but at this time not much business existed. Corporations, which is the way we think of business today, and global commerce, the way we think of business today, arrived at about the same time as colonialism and chattel slavery. Now, this is not going to be a word-for-word -word reading of Chapter 5, so if you want more detail about the rise of the corporation, I recommend to you to read Chapter 5 for yourself. And there's also a wonderful book by Garrett Sutton, in Own Your Own Corporation, he describes the rise of the corporation to the late 1500s. But this is also at the same time that both white and African slaves were being imported to both North and South America. Much of the labor that produced sugar, tobacco, cotton, coffee, rice, chocolate, gold, and silver, which were the very first things traded by the earliest corporations, much of the labor that produced those things was unpaid labor. Today we call that slavery. Every February you may hear in passing that African Americans living today are the descendants of Africa that were bought to North and South America as slaves. Needless to say, much of their labor made having a plantation or a company in the United States profitable. The use of free labor from many sources, Native Americans, Africans, and also European white slaves, is the basis for a lot of the business that we see today. The system is used to having free labor. More detail will be available in your reading of Chapter 5. But if you ever wonder how the music industry is set up so that musicians don't get paid, now you know. That comes from the music industry's big brothers in big business. There is one very specific example from African American history that you need to understand to understand exactly how the music industry works. <clears throat> At the end of the Civil War, we celebrate that slaves became free at the end of the Civil War. A very little known part of history has to do with how these African Americans who just came out of slavery were, in all intents and purposes in the South, pretty much re-enslaved by, by a system called sharecropping. The plantation owners still needed labor to harvest their fields. And, because of the rise of Jim Crow laws, African Americans were not allowed to work in many industries. So, the farmer masters came up with an idea. Come back to us, work the land, and we'll give you a share of the crops you raise as your payment. Hence the term sharecropping. This was the theory, but reality was very different. There is a book called African Americans in the U.S. Economy by Donald Fussfeld and Timothy Bates. And it describes how many sharecroppers purchased or leased their seed and equipment in addition to leasing the quarters they had once been housed in as slaves from the plantation owners. But many African Americans had been prevented from learning how to read and write during the centuries of their enslavement. 
So they had no way to defend themselves against terms in their leases and contracts that permitted the plantation owners to charge outrageous interest on the things that they loaned. Nor did the sharecroppers have any right to look into whatever the plantation owners reported their debts were. Nor could the sharecroppers examine the report on how big the crop had been and whether they had actually raised enough crops to pay off their debt and turn a profit. Some plantation owners routinely said their workers still owed them at the end of the year. And so the sharecroppers had no choice but to borrow more seed and more equipment, take more bad contracts, and get deeper into manufactured debt year after year, generation after generation. Slavery by law ended in 1865. Debt bondage for many African Americans had not com ended completely by 1965. Do you see any parallel between this history and what you have been reading about in earlier chapters of the Freedom Guide? The music industry's policy of recouping all costs for an album's creation makes every bit of what companies provide to musicians a loan, a loan constructed in terms that it cannot be paid back. Without an audit clause, you are not able to ever know if you have paid back the company's loan. This is very similar to the fact that African Americans in sharecropping had no choice but to lease all their equipment and all their seed and a place to live, and were denied the opportunity to ever know if they had done enough work to pay their landowners back. And in the same way that the cross-collateralization clause allows debt to be rolled from one album to another, from one project to another, and sometimes over the whole length of a musician's career, the plantation owners in those days would say that the sharecroppers had not been paid at the end of the year, and so they rolled that debt from year to year to year for a century. I am the grandchild of sharecroppers and the friend of, old, of younger sharecroppers whom I know. This situation did persist. But every time you go into the music industry unaware, whether you are black, white, Latino, or Asian, you are signing yourself up for your own version of being sharecropped. It's not just for African Americans in history anymore. This is why you must educate yourself on the way the music industry works and take every precaution that you can, beginning with properly registering your copyrights, also with respecting other people's copyrights, with licensing, and learning what is in your contracts. As an African American, I do not wish on anyone any part of the experience of my ancestors. If you do not understand what you are getting into as a musician, you will have part of that experience because you will be tricked into working for free. But there is hope. The Freedom Guide for Music Creators is not named in vain. Musicians of all backgrounds and interests are finding ways around offering themselves up as ignorant victims to the big music companies. Just by reading this book, you are helping yourself avoid becoming another source of free labor to enrich the many music business owners who would like to exploit you. Take the time to understand what has been presented here. I